Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this webinar called Logic and Computing in Polypad. I am super excited you're all joining us either live or watching this after the fact. My name is David Porras. I'm the head of content for Mathagon and a middle school math teacher outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'd love to see who we have with us on the on the call this evening on the on the live stream. So if you want to drop your name in the chat and perhaps where you are in the world and maybe your role in education or what brings you to this webinar tonight, it'd be great to learn about who is joining us on this. Good morning in Thailand. That is super exciting. Our first comment uh, from Thailand. I'm in the United States and it's great to have people from all over the world. So welcome aboard. Uh, I'm going to start around 7.02 about two minutes past the hour on the East Coast. So as we're waiting for people to join, if you want to put your information into the chat, that would be great. Hello, Mark from upstate New York. Great to be with you again. Kurt from Seattle, welcome. It is super exciting uh, to have everyone here and talk about logic and computing in Polypad. Um, so again, I'll start in another minute or so once people hop on the stream. Uh, it's, uh, I'm really excited to share some of these new tools that we have on Polypad with logic and computing. I think some really exciting ways to engage kids in thinking about computers. From Georgia, awesome. Good evening from Georgia. So let me add my screen here to the canvas. This is mathagon.org. As you may know, Mathagon is a mathematical playground where online learning has never been so interactive and engaging. Mathagon is free for teachers and students around the world. So everything I'm showing to you tonight is free for all users, uh, and you can dive right in and um, get going. So I'm going to go to Polypad, which is up here in the top. I'm going to click on Polypad, and it is going to open a blank canvas for exploring, discovering, creating mathematics. I'm going to go to full screen mode. And so everything I'm going to show tonight is here in Polypad. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Uh, on the left are all the, the categories of tiles that we have. So if you are brand new to Mathagon and Polypad, welcome. This is our virtual manipulatives, our, our space for exploring and playing with mathematics. We have a number of tile categories for the, for the virtual manipulatives, polygons and, and tangrams, patterns and art. We have a numbers category with all sorts of number tiles that you can explore and play with on the screen. But we are here tonight to talk about logic and computing. I will show you over the course of the webinar uh, where you can go learn more about all the other tile types we have. But the goal of the, web of the webinar tonight is logic and computing. This is under the games and applications section. So I'll expand the logic and computing. Just to kind of set the frame before we um, jump in, welcome to those just joining in the chat, New Jersey and Connecticut, California, awesome. Um, the goal of this webinar is twofold. One, it's like an introduction into logic. What are these logic gates? What are the memory gates? What are the inputs and outputs? If you are an expert in logic gates and you came to learn super advanced features about building all sorts of intricate circuits, this is not the webinar for you. We might have some of those down the road, but this is really like logic and computing 101. The other thing this webinar is going to focus on is how to use these tools with students uh, from all ages of students. So perhaps you are a computing and gates expert, but you might want to think about ways to use those with students. This webinar could be a good tool, or that's part of the goal of this webinar as well. So if you uh, just want to put that out there at the beginning, if you feel like you are an expert in logic and computing, and you're not interested in hearing ways to use this for students, uh, might not be a good use of your time. But I hope you stick around. Maybe you can you can add some ideas and put those in the chat along the way. If at any point you have a question, feel free to drop that in the chat. I will be paying attention to the chat as well. I might answer it in the moment or table it for later. And at the end of the webinar, I will stay on and answer any questions at all that people have. So all that out of the way, let me jump in. I'm going to put a button and a switch on the canvas. And there are two ways to do that. As you can see, I can just, I can click and drag or if I click on the tile type, that'll appear on the canvas as well. This white space I'm going to be calling the canvas. And as you notice, these switches act as an input. And when I click on a button or turn the switch on and off, that little triangle goes from blue to orange as I'm doing that. But if I click and drag on that triangle, you can see that's like a wire. 
So all of the input, the buttons and the switches have a wire extending from it. And an output that we have on the canvas is a light. So I just added a light to the canvas. And you can see that if I attach uh, the wire from the, from the output, it, it snaps to that blue circle on the output. And then when I turn on the switch, the light goes on. And notice also when the switch is on, the wire changes from blue to orange. A really nice uh, visual to show that when it's on, that signal is being sent. This on is sending a signal through the wire to the output. And when the output gets a signal of on, it goes on. Here, it's a click. I can click, I can hold it down if I wanted to. But on the switch, you can turn the switch on and off. Now, I'm going to copy a switch. And I'm going to copy the light. A number of ways to copy tiles. There's a copy feature down at the bottom. I could click on that. I'm also just going to use the C button on my keyboard. And so what I want to show you is that a single switch, um, I can attach this switch to lots of lights. Right? So I can drag all those wires up here and have this one switch control those four lights. I can't have a single light controlled by multiple switches. Right? That's not going to attach there because that light can't have two, two inputs coming in. It only can have one input, but you can have lots of wires coming from one switch. And then what's kind of fun is you can change the color of the lights. So I can make this light purple, and I'll make this light blue, and I'll make this light green. And now when I turn on the switch, all those lights go on in different colors, which uh, is kind of fun to play with. So I shared just this super fast introduction with my class. I'm a seventh grade teacher, but I've, I've shared this with my, my children at home. I have a third grader and a sixth grader. They've taken to it and jumped right in. And before I did anything else, I just said in class, go play with the lights. And they added lights and switches and colors and did all sorts of things. And I've saved a couple of them uh, to share with you. So I'm now in Polypad. I'm going to go from the tile section to the file where if you have an account, again, you can make a free account, a teacher account, or a student account. You can save Polypads to your account. So I'm going to click on File. I've made a folder of them. And I just have a few examples to share. So these are examples that my students made after like maybe seven minutes of playing just with lights and switches. And that's kind of fun. It makes just a nice pretty pattern. Um, I also like the visual of the of the wires have a nice artistic feel to them. In this one, here's one that a student made that uh, makes a little face when all the wires go on. So here, all of those wires are actually going to all of the lights. So what you can see is there some of the lights look like they're turning off, but in fact, they're all turning on. You can see that one has a wire attached to it. A feature that we are going to be adding hopefully soon is the ability to hide all the wires. So right now, the wires in this example are kind of getting in the way of the picture, even if I put it down here. So coming soon is the ability to decide if you want the wires to be invisible or not. And if they were invisible, this makes that um, a little more fun. This uh, a student started and did not get very far. They had this whole grid of lights. And they had some switches that I think were on their way to uh, like to spelling something. They didn't get very far. Uh, you can see what this student wants to spell. A student trying to get in good with the math teacher. I can make this a little bit bigger. You can turn on all the lights to spell math, which is kind of fun. And the final one to show was this student um, spell something. And again, you might be able to kind of see it with the wires here. But imagine a polypad where you can hide the wires and then you can just click and a message appears, and the student said hi. So again, nothing super deep yet, but just I, I introduced the, the switches and lights to students and said, just go play. And they had a good time with it. And through that, they're, they're developing this idea that one switch can have lots of outputs. Uh, you can control lots of things with a switch, and so on. All right, so I'm going to go to a new polypad. I can do that um, right here under my library. I can click New Polypad. I don't want to save these changes. I'll go back to tiles, and I want to talk about these gates. So the way I explained it to my students, and if gates are new to you, picture like a gate at your house. The gate is open or closed. And sometimes a message can go through a gate, and sometimes it can't. And so what these green things are, are, are gates that they each have a rule that either allows a message to be sent through or not. And each gate has a different rule. So what I said to my students is put a gate on the canvas. I think I started actually with the AND gate. And I said, put that on the canvas. 
and see if you can figure out the rule for the AND gate. And without do doing anything else, after playing with those lights for a while, they saw that those blue things receive a wire. So they put a couple switches on the canvas. You know, they, I had certainly some students that were confused about what to do and I went and helped them a little bit. And this is the wire, so there's an output. And we can think about what's happening with the AND gate. So I turn that on, the gate does not, does not let the output go through. What about if I turn this one on? Does not let the output go through. But if I turn them both on, the output, the, the message goes through the output, right? So as, I, as I'm thinking about this, if this is new to you, and as I was explaining to students, there's like a mechanism inside that gate that's deciding when to open. And on the AND gate here, it will only open and send the message through when both of them are on. So if this is on and this is on, then the message will go through. And then what I asked them to do is kind of docu document that into a sentence. So maybe they said the message goes through when both inputs are on or something, or the light goes on when both inputs are on, not one, are on. And then I had them do the OR gate. And the same thing, you know, the same idea, I'm just going to copy these and bring them down here and I'll copy the light and bring it down here. Again, I'm just using the C button on my keyboard to copy tiles. I'll start with them both off and I'll put this on. And what they saw here, so this is the OR gate. I'm going to add a text box just to make this clear. I'm now thinking about the OR gate. Um, I can uh, make this bold if I want and make it a little bit bigger. And in the OR gate, when I turn this one on, the light goes on. When I turn that one on, the light goes on. When I turn them both on, the light goes on. And so what students observed here was that in the OR gate, the output is on. Oops. The output is on when either or both inputs are on. And so they kind of continued and explore that, but I wanted to introduce to them at this point the idea of a truth table. And so truth tables take what I've put in sentences and apply some structure and some numbers to describing how these gates work. So let me just do a quick example of this because then uh, I'll show you where there is a lesson plan on how to use these with students. So in a truth table, I'm going to call this input A, and I'll just copy that and call this input B. Welcome from Ontario. Awesome. And the output is often called Q. If you know why in logics and gates and circuits why the output is called Q, drop that in the chat. I actually don't know that yet. I keep meaning to go look it up. Um, I am learning a lot about logic gates as these unfold on Polypad. So if that's knowledge that you have, feel free to share it with us. So I'm going to turn them both off, and I'm going to add a table to the canvas here to construct my truth table. And so you can find a table in Polypad under the algebra section, under coordinate axes and tables. And so I will put that table on the canvas. I want three columns, so I'm going to drag this black handle to extend it. And I'm going to call this A, and this B, and this Q. And I'm going to add a couple more rows, and I'll just kind of zoom out a little bit. So here's the truth table. And what's happening right now, A is off and B is off. And as you may know, an off is represented by a zero and also Q is off. So the, the first row of this table, what this says is when A is off and B is off, the output is off. But if we turn on A, we can see that when A is on and B is off, the output is on. So that's one, zero, one. This one we saw is, uh, a is off, B is on, the output is on. And then the final one was when they're both on, the output is on as well. I missed the one there. So there's the truth table for the OR gate. And I was talking with students about how that zero is the, is the numerical representation of off, and the one is the numerical representation of on. And then my task for them was just go build all the truth tables for all of these gates. So I just did, um, we did one together, and then they went and explored on their own and built all these truth tables. This is actually written up as a, as a lesson plan on Polypad. So I just want to pause for a second to show you where to find that. On the right of the canvas is a question mark. And if I click on that help button, there is a link to a, a Polypad tutorial guide, just all the ins and outs of Polypad. 
there are tutorials on all of these all of these sections but i'm going to click on lesson plans which brings us to our task page mathagon.org tasks again i got here just by the question mark pulled up a link to the lesson plan page and in this lesson plan page there's over 125 puzzles games lesson plans, student explorations. I'm just gonna search for logic. And you can see there are three things that we have so far on logic. The first one is, well, actually I'm, I'm gonna take a look at the second one, which I've been talking about, logic gates and truth tables. And I click on that, here's a lesson plan, kind of like an intro of everything I've just done in the last 12 minutes. But what I wanna show you is, it has a key here for teachers, right? This isn't one that you'd share with students. This is a teacher lesson plan. Um, if you feel like your students would, would benefit from some structure of a pre-made canvas, here's a pre-made canvas where uh, it's labeled with the specific gate. There are the switches and the table is made with the ones and the zeros. So I didn't provide this to my students. I felt like in seventh grade they could organize the canvas as they like and try to explore with it. But if you think your students would benefit from a little more structure as they're exploring what these logic gates are and these truth tables. You could share that from the lesson plan. All right, so that's one way to explore a gate is with a truth table. Um, the other way to explore how logic gates work is with wavelengths. So I'm going to um, pull up a new canvas. This one is not yet on the task page. It will be at some point, but I'm gonna drop this link in the chat. So if you want to explore with it on your own, um, you can do so. So let me just uh, put this in the chat. There we go. There is that. Um, there's that link. And uh, I'm just going to project a comment. Carol says, this is exactly why I came here. I'm so glad I teach logic in my math course. And this looks like a great way to bring truth tables to life for students. Awesome, Carol. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm excited to continue this. Uh, webinar. Hopefully you'll have some other, uh, other. Um, there'll be some other ideas here that you could use with your students as well. Um, and I love that you um, shared that this could be helpful at a college level. Again, I mentioned at the beginning, I'm doing this with my third grader and she's had a good time playing with lights and gates and, and uh, all sorts of things. So the other way to provide some structure about um, how logic gates work is with like a wavelength graph that shows in graphical form how the things are changing. So right now you can see, let me go to full screen. Both of these are, are off. So I'm gonna go to the drawing tools and I'm gonna use the ruler, which can draw a straight line. Let me just zoom in a little bit. And the ruler draws a straight line and I'm gonna go back and forth between different colors. I'm first gonna draw a line to represent that A is off. So that's at the bottom. And then I'll draw a line to represent that B is off. And when they're off in the XOR gate, the output is off. So I think I'm doing that one in orange to match the light. So right now, that first part of the graph is saying when A is, is off and B is off, Q is off, the output is off. And this is showing this in um, a graphical representation. And now let's see what happens when I turn on A. Ah, so A went on, which kind of feels like an OR gate but let's keep exploring with this gate and see what happens. So now A goes on, so I'll drag this line up and have it go over two, so it'll stay on for a beat of two or something. Uh, B is staying off, so that's down here. And then the light went on, so I'll draw that line over. This is, again, is not written up as a full lesson plan. I put the link to this in the chat, but I think this could also be a good way for students to, to explore how these gates work. Let me turn this one off and this one on. And we see it has the same sort of impact as an OR gate. So now I'll say, all right, when this one came off, it, that one was off. This one went on here. And when that happened, the light stayed on. So we have this, um, that thing going on. And then this feels like an OR gate, right? But when I turn them both uh, off, let's see what happens. Oh, sorry. When they're both on here, notice the light is off. Right, I'm getting my ons and off confused. I turn them both on and the light goes off, which is different than the OR gate. In the OR gate, when they were both on, the light was on. So when I show this graphically, here the light went off, but the this was on. That's a different shade of red, but I think you get the idea. And this one was on. 
And then if you wanted to extend this like truth table a little bit more visually to show when the light is on, you could go to the polygon section, always take the opportunity to show off the custom polygon. The custom polygon, you can change the shape of it. You can add vertices. If, if um, you click on a line, it'll add a vertex. If I click on a vertex, it'll go away. I want to show the part of this graph where the output is on. So I'm covering up, I don't need that uh, vertex. I've covered that up with that rectangle. It kind of is too dark and is covering up too much of it. So I'm going to make it like a yellow. And under the color picker, I just chose the color here. Under these sliders, you can, the bottom slider is the transparency slider. So I can put this like in the 20s or something. And now I can see that that part of the graph is when the output is on. And that kind of shows uh, in a visual representation that when we have on off, it's on. When we have off on, it's on, but not when they're either both off or both on. So again, this is just sort of exploring with Gates. Um, I'm going to show you something at the end, a demo that I shared with my students that helped build the excitement of why they're learning how these Gates work. Uh, it feels pretty abstract right now. I think there's just fun joy and mathematical thinking and logic in building a truth table with this, making a graph. Uh, but we really are using these tools to build interesting kind of circuits and um, structures. So I'm going to keep moving on and talk about those a little bit. Oh, the final thing to share, which is in the lesson plan before I move on, let me go back to the lesson plan page um, and search by logic. Uh, I've not done this yet with my students. This will be the next task is um, using what they know about gates to build like a decision tree. So this lesson plan, you can go read on your own. I'm just going to use it as a way to get a link. And so here, uh, we can see there are there's something covered up by this polygon. So I've used a custom polygon and made it purple to cover up the gates and switches. And right now it's saying if it's not raining and if it's not windy, I might go for a walk. What happens if it starts to rain? Oh, if it's raining and not windy, I don't want to do either. But if it's not raining, I might go for a walk. But if it's windy, then I could fly a kite. What happens if it's doing both? If it's not raining and windy, I don't want to do either. And so I might uh, challenge students, can you figure out the mechanism under this polygon? And they could go try to build it. They might need some, you know, some assistance. I, I, I could really get into more details with the knots. It's not raining, right? So we want the opposite of that. I could, if I wanted to use the transparency slider to give them a sneak peek. It's kind of fun, right? What's, what's going on? And then can they go build it on their own? Or I could just take the polygon out of the way. And after understanding about the gates, they, they might be able to explain why this works. And then the fun part of the task would be go build your own decision tree, right? How do you know what to pack in your bag in the morning? Do you need your instrument or not? Uh, what kind of weather do you need to prepare for? Is it uh, a snack day? Do you need a snack after school? And they could have all of these things here that they need to either click on or off. And then, uh, you know, you could have some outputs on the right depending on, on what to do. Uh, so that is, I think, a fun sort of application of understanding about these um, gates. Let me get to the gates. There we go. So the last category are these memory things. If you have any questions in the chat, feel free to um, drop them in the chat. A fun comment by Mark. May as well pop one on the screen. This is really helpful for building logic-based formulas in a spreadsheet. Oh, awesome. I, I had not thought of the connection to doing this in a spreadsheet, so that's cool. And good morning from Indonesia, welcome. That is super exciting that you are here from Indonesia. So keep the questions coming in the chat. I will stay on at the end and answer any questions as well. Um, but let me talk about these uh, memory things. So as we can kind of see here on the screen, the gates can be combined to create a wide variety of circuits. I'm gonna show you some really wild ones at the end. Um, good, another one from Indonesia, awesome. I'm going to show you some wild gates at the end, but you can see just a really small um, circuit machine here of gates. There are some combinations of gates that are used so frequently that they're like pre-made as a memory latch. So all of these things in the memory section are really just a complicated combination of gates that are used so often in the world of logic and computing that they're sort of understood as a, as a pre-built um, gate. So let me show you an example. Uh, I have this just in, in my um, file right now. So let me pull up the one that I want to do. I'll put this 
in the chat so you have access to it later if you're interested. Uh, so there it is in the chat. And I just want to zoom in on this part right here. And this is called the T flip-flop. And just as I, as I turn it on and off, see if you can figure out the rule of the T flip-flop. If you know the rule and you're a memory gate pro, maybe hold off on putting it in the chat just to allow people some think time. So right now, uh, there is nothing happening. Let me see if you can figure out what's going on. I turned it off and on. Off, on. On, off. On, off. On, off. Not the most exciting thing to watch, but maybe what you noticed, I will um, add this text box um, onto the canvas, is what's happening here to change the state of the output, like to get the light to change either from on to off or off to on, right? The input must go on and then off, right? So in order to get the light to change, let me just make this bigger, what needs to happen in the T flip-flop is this has to go from on to off. That turned the light on. Now, if I want to turn the light off, I need to do it again, on, off. Now it's off. If I want to get it on, I need to go on, off. And the T here stands for toggle. Toggle is like going back and forth, right? So what's happening here is I got to flip the switch to toggle the state of the light, all right? Here's why this is really helpful in the world of computing. This is just a really simple example. But I'm going to scroll over here on my canvas and go to full screen here and zoom out a little bit. And what I want you to notice is what happens as I count the number of on-offs. So here we go, I'm gonna go on, off. That turned on this light. But notice there's two wires that are coming on this output. This wire is going to a light. This wire got turned on, but nothing happens yet because I haven't turned it off, right? Again, to get the output to go into, to get the output to send a message, the input has to go on then off. So this has gone on and off, so that has the light on. This one has just gone on. So when I, when I do one on off, all that happens is this first light goes on, all right? Think about what's gonna happen when I go on off again. I'm gonna go on, nothing happens because I haven't gone off. But now when I go off, this is gonna change. This is gonna change to blue, which is gonna cause this to go to orange. There's a message trying to get through here, but it doesn't get through until this goes off. Here we go, boop, it did it. So two on-offs, get that one to go on. Think about what happens with three. I can collapse the tile menu. I'm just going to click on the tile menu to just get me some more room on the canvas here. All right. So now three, I'm going to go on-off. So now on, a message is going through. Nothing happens until I turn it off. When I turn it off, this is going to turn orange. This is going to turn orange, right? But it's not going to change anything yet because this one isn't going to change. I go off, we get this one on and this one on. And spoiler alert, if you've spent time with binary, you might see what's going on here, right? Watch what happens on this one. I'm going to go on and off. When I do this, this is going to change. This is going to change, which is going to cause that to change. So we're finally going to get this one to go on. So we'll have off, off, on. There's four. One, zero, zero is four in base two. So there's four. Let me just do five, because it's kind of fun. Five, we'll get that one to turn on, right? There's five. But let's see what 13 is going to be. Let me zoom out a little bit. So I'm at five now. Here is six, seven. Eight's kind of fun, right? This is the place values base two. This is one, two, four, eight. In order to get that one on, this off is going to have a cascading effect. I wish I could do it in slow motion, but what's going to happen? This will go blue which will cause that to go blue, which will cause that to glow, go blue, which will cause this to go orange. All of these will go blue as well, turning all of them off. So there is eight, all right? Let me get up to 13. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 is, um, let me just do it over here. This one, oh, I missed this one that one and that one. And as you may know, 13 in base two is 1101. 
So what's happening here is like a base two counter. I'm counting in base two with these T flip-flops and that on off of the T flip-flop is causing what's, um, you know, what's happening here. Let me just um, add one more thing here, which I think is um, super cool. I'm going to go to a, um, another canvas that I've made that I'll put in the chat. Just another example of kind of how this is working in base two. So let me just get this link. I'll get out of full screen so you can have this in the meeting as well. There we go. All right, and this one, I'm gonna click it 25 times. So now I've taken what I had before and I've just kind of tilted it on its side so it matches up kind of with, with place values in base two. I think I've, I've, I've lost the other one here. Um, but, uh, right, so this is the, the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, the eights place, the 16s place, and the 30 seconds place in base two. And so I'm gonna click this 25 times. Now, in the one I was just showing you, it was a slider switch. Now I just have the button, so I can just click it. I don't have to go on off. A click of a button is a really fast on off, right? So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. There's the 13 that we had before. One, one, zero, one. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And so 25 in base two, as you may know, is one, one, zero, zero, one. It's a 16 and an eight is 24. No eights, no fours, and a one is 25. And binary base two, these switches, right? I, I probably haven't emphasized this enough, is the underpinning of computers, right? That's how computers are built, are, are on these switches and and base two. Um, if you've spent some time with James Tanton and explored the world of exploding dots, you know it's a great way to think about numbers in different bases. And in our number section, we have under additional tools, these exploding dot machines. And so really encourage you to go to um, explodingdots.org, I think it is, the global math week with James Tanton. And you can explore this in greater detail but on Polypad, here's an exploding dot machine. You can change the base that you are working in. So this is a base two machine. I can turn on the number labels here under settings. So I want to see the number labels. And you can see it's kind of small, but these are the place values, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And here are 25 dots. I'm going to put them in the ones place. And we can explode these dots. Every two makes one of these. So I'll just let it explode, and you can see what happens. It's nice sound effects. And eventually it should end up at 11001 if I didn't mess up, which uh, is a solid chance, but I think, I, I think I'm good. There it is, 11001. And I really like that, that connection of how you can get there with switches and clicks and T flip-flops, and then the visual of the dots exploding, right? You can change this to a 10-1 machine, 10 dots would explode to one. A five one, five dots would explode to one um, to explore that in lots of different ways. Uh, so that is one example of the gates. I have one more example to share. And then I want to show you uh, some things that are coming soon to our logic and computing on Polypad that I am super excited about as well. So the last gate I want to explore, and if you have any questions at all, put them in the chat. Uh, hopefully you're getting some ideas of how these work and how you could use them with students. Um, the final one that I want to share with you is the, the D flip-flop, right? So uh, let me just pause here for one second and show you that under the help menu, you can find our full tutorial, right? But notice over here, there's a question mark as well. And so right next to logic and computing, there's a question mark. If I click on that question mark, it brings you to the actual tutorial page directly on logic and computing. And so all this page, I have a couple of videos of how this works. There's an explanation of all of the logic gates. Um, you know, the AND gate omits on if and only if both are on. So there's a sentence description of all of the gates. I'm not going to show you all of those. And then there's a more in-depth description of, of the memory gates. So we were just talking about the toggle flip-flop. If you want to go back and read a description again about how any of these gates work, um, that's here in the tutorial page. Again, you can get there right by this question mark under logic and computing. You can also get there under the help menu. And again, I just want to show you our, 
our task page that has 125 and growing teaching ideas. But if you just search for logic, here are the three that I've showed you. That's our tutorial. There's the truth table and the decision trees. But let me move on and explore the um, data, the D flip-flop. And the D stands for data. And I will put this in the chat as well because it's not yet on our tutorial page. Uh, yep. Can't not show that comment, right? Just mind blown. Thanks, Mark. I know. I think it's super exciting and I can't wait to dive in more with this, both on my own and with my students as well. Um, so in the, in the D flip-flop, this top wire sends an incoming message. The bottom button tells the gate to take this message and keep it and send it through until you click this again. So right now I'm going to click this and it's going to say, okay, this, this gate is going to capture this off and send off until I, I reset by clicking the bottom button. So let me do it again because I, I wanted to show it better. Here, I'm going to click this button. So what that has told is telling this machine, keep send off no matter what. It captured what was coming in, and it captured it, and it kind of like severed it almost, and it's going to send off no matter what. Even if I turn this on, notice the output doesn't change. Turning this on doesn't do anything because it's told keep sending out, keep sending off until this is clicked again. So now I'm going to click it, and it's going to capture this new message coming in. So I click this, and now it's sending out on no matter what. If I turn this off, it doesn't change. So this is called a data flip-flop because it's, it's capturing the data coming in from the top one and sending it out until you reset it. It'll keep sending this until you reset it. So now I've reset it, and I've gone from there. All right. So let me show you why this might be helpful. I'm going to go to this canvas, uh, D flip flop register, which this one is actually, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but I want to show you where you can get this on your own. So there it is in the chat. Under file, these are all my files, right? As a, uh, I have a whole lot of folders and saved polypads, but all of you, whether you have an account or not, again, it's free for everyone to make an account. Uh, at the bottom of the file menu is examples and templates. And we have a growing collection of, of ones in, um, in logic and, com and computing. We saw the, the T flip-flop counter, um, now on the D flip-flop register, now that we understand how this works. So what I'm gonna do here uh, is I'm going to turn on this one, this one, this one, and this one. And I want to store that. So now that's sending all these inputs here. I just want to, yep. And I'm going to click store and these lights are going to go on. Boom, 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 boom. And now if I change these, it doesn't change anything, right? Because I haven't hit store. And what I've just done in base two, I've just made the number 10111. This is the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, and the 16s place. So that number that I've made is one. Oh, let me change my text color here. It's transparent. That's not helpful. Here we go. One, oh, one, one, one. Imagine this whole thing is rotated 90 degrees. In fact, I might just do it. I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to rotate it like this. Oh, I missed. But watch, I can, I can do it again. So easy just to rotate things. There we go. That's a lot clearer for the demo I'm trying to do. I've built one, oh, one, one, one. Right now, I want to do a new number. So I don't even need to clear them. I'm going to, but I want to build 1101. So 1101. And I'll hit store just to see it. There it is, 1101. So let me just copy this and I'm going to make a new number, 1101. So that's how the store works. Now, what I want to do, I want to add these together. I want to add 10111 and 1101. And I'm going to add those together in this other example we have here called a full adder. And this is actually showing the inner workings of how addition can happen. So I'm going to go to the full adder. And yeah, I don't need to save that. Look at this. Um, we have a, uh, an engineer at, at Mathagon that, that put this together. Her name is Kyra. You're going to see some of her work in a little bit. But she put this full adder together. I have worked hard to understand this part of it. 
and in this part of it. I am not yet able to explain how the middle part works, but I just want to show you what it does because it's super cool to see. So what I just did on the other canvas was we were adding uh, 10111 plus, I'm going to make this bigger in a second, plus 1101, right? Here we go. I make this a lot bigger. Do, 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 right? And so we're going to add those together. And before we add them together, I actually want to find out what the answer is going to be. 10111 plus 1101. And to do that, I'm going to go to an exploding dot machine because that's where I find my brain does really well with thinking about adding in base two. So let me go to additional tools and an exploding dot machine. I want this to be base two. And I think I'm going to need six boxes. And let me get a dot on the screen here. So let me close this, get it out of the way, move these over here and make it much bigger so we can see what's going on. So there's my dot. Oh, let me zoom in here. All right. And scroll over here. So I want to add these together. I'm going to copy this dot to build one O, oh, oops, uh, one, one, one. There's the first number. And then I'm going to add on to that one, one, oh, one. So I've put those together in this exploding dot machine. And if I explode the dots, it's going to find the answer for me. So I'm going to explode the dots. I'll hit explode. You can see the explosions happening. Boo, boo. And it equals 100100. So the answer to this that we should get, just to show you that the answer is 10010. Right. That's the answer. And I could convert this to base 10 to show you this actually is the right answer. But you might believe me through the exploding dots. So now let me show you how this works, how this adder works, now that we know what the answer should be. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to do this first number that is, remember, this is like backwards, right? So this is the first one. So this is 1, 1, 1, 0, oh, 1. That's the first number. I'm going to store that by clicking store A, which is the green thing. And watch what happens over here. So I store A. All those lights go on, 1, 1, 1, 0, oh, 1. All right, so that's the first number that this little calculator is storing. Now I'm going to make 1101, 1101, turn that one off. So I've made 1101. I want to store that as B, and the output here is going to become A plus B. So we should get 100100, right? Store B, let's see. Oh, oh no, I messed up somehow. Maybe you saw what I did wrong. Oh, because that is not 10010. Oh, oh, oh. I have a one in the wrong spot. Let me try one more time. All right. This is 11110. One, one, oh, oh, I think I know where I messed up. 11101. Oh, one. There's A. And then B is 1011. Oh, one, one. I went the wrong way. The second time I, when I built B, I went 1101. One, oh, one. I was going the wrong way. It should have been 1011. Oh, one, one. All right. So now that I've done it, store B. There we go, 100100, right? So like maybe kind of cool to see, but imagine this is this is the dream, getting to the point where students can build this, right? This isn't something I would just show and demo with students. That's, I mean, it's kind of cool to see, but getting them to the point where they could understand how this is working. Now, not with a second, third, fourth grader, but like eventually getting to the point where all these gates, students have understanding of how these gates work, I think would be super cool. Um, so that is the, the final piece I wanted to share about Gates. The last thing for tonight, and then I'll, I will happily answer any questions that you may have, is um, I, have some, I have some demos to share with you. So these um, are not live yet on Polypad and are not what they're going to look like when they're eventually on Polypad, but uh, they're ones that I think will really engage and excite People of all ages. So the first one is additional ways to have an output. So right now, the only way to have an output is a light, right? So let me just get rid of this uh, beautifulness here and just remind you that the only output that we have is a light. We have this switch and we have a light and you can do all sorts of fun things with it like I've showed you over the course of the webinar. But imagine if this was sound and you could change how things are going with sound. So let me show you an example of what's happening with sound here. Here's a video to I'm watch. Working on relating to linking and this is Kyra talking. I can't zoom into the video. And 
inputs and switches and metronomes and logic gates and latches and the sound players you can pick things and there's like uh step sequences now that's like a metronome I mean, how fun is this? Imagine students being able, which is coming soon to a polypad near you. Imagine students being able to add sound outputs in these boxes. You can change the size of these boxes to be able to add beats um, at different sequences. Think about the connections between common multiples, right? How often do you want something to repeat? How cool will that be? You can like uh, divide tempos up and down. Um, and then of course you can, you know, yeah, change the size of those sequences. And this, as students have a really like simple understanding of how gates work, what, what I showed um, at the beginning, or as you might have noticed in the beginning of the video, there is an output here that's attached to an AND gate. And in the first version of this, the ON was a 1 and the OFF was a 0, unlike the switches that we have now. Um, but I think this will be so fun for kids to be able to explore and play with. So that's really cool. Uh, I agree, Carol. Very cool. Let me show you another example of how students will be able to build like machines and demos and simulations and stuff. So let me add this video for you here. This new tile here that uh, splits an incoming logic signal either to one output or the other. So just to clarify that, there's that yellow tile. It'll probably look different in our final form. This is a draft. And what that yellow tile does, it randomly sends the signal through one output or the other. So a signal comes in and it'll use some, you know, uh, there's mathematics in that tile that decides to send the input through the top one or the bottom one on a 50-50 basis. Um, and so you can see what she's built with that here. And if you combine it with OR gates, you can build uh, a golden board. So as she's clicking that button at the top, a signal is coming through the, the, the far left, the side of it, and it's coming through. And at each point, it has it like a 50-50 choice to make. A golden board is that thing with all the pegs in it, and you pour the marbles in, and the marbles come out in like the normal distribution. But this is a, a coded version of that. Again, cool to see. Imagine kids building this, right? Which is is coming. That's the power of Polypad, I think, is is not watching someone who built something, which you're doing tonight, watching me show you things to watch, but getting to the point where students are are doing it on their own. Yes, we have Ida on the on the webinar who has written an awesome Galton board lesson on Polypad, which I will pull up in a minute. Well, you can say every time you click this button, you can just duplicate a uh, a tile wherever the light lights up um, and if you do this enough times much like the falling beads in a physical version and flip this on its side you get the uh, binomial distribution which is kind of cool and i've made it so that you can select these logic tiles and make them invisible and there's still a few bugs but um yeah you can actually hide the mechanism and it will still operate so you could make like little machines um. So that is super exciting. Um, one piece that we've talked about, I don't know if it'll be out there anytime soon, would, the, would, would be the ability to change the probabilities that are used in those tiles. So now as a default, it's 50-50. It's what if you made it 25-75? What would the distribution like? Um, what if you had certain gates that were cut off or something? And there's a, there's a task about that. And the final demo to share is just some other ideas we've been thinking about. Not sure if these will make it into the final version. Build little um, machines with them now, um, which is which is pretty cool. So there's that output that's added on now, like a counter, right? So it's um, it's counting based on the number of clicks that I was doing, and this stops at uh, at 15 because there's only there's only four of them and she has it set to make a little sound when it gets to 15 and then it'll reset. So you can see how that goes. There was a little, boop, got to 15. Yeah, kind this is um, just a little machine that demonstrates. 
I agree. Pretty cool. Um, let me show you our task on the Gone board because it came up. So I want to give that. Uh, this would just be under our lesson plan page. If you search Galton Board, oh, I spelled it wrong. There it is, Galton Board. Um, Ida is one of our content writers at, at Mathagon, and she's wrote, written this awesome lesson on Polypad with a Galton Board that uses some of the tiles that we currently have available. Um, but so you could explore this. It's an awesome lesson um, and go as well. While I have you here, just in the closing minutes, um, I hope you found things of use. You're still here. You could have logged off anytime you want. So maybe that's that's good feedback that there were some ideas that were, were worthy of your time and exploring with students. There is so much to explore on Polypad. Uh, if you are new to Mathagon, welcome. We have a user guide you can explore that talks you through all the uses of Polypad. I've showed you our lesson plan page. Accessibility has all our keyboard shortcuts. And let me just highlight our for teachers page. Uh, I'll open it up in a new tab here. And this has all of our past uh, events and webinars. So you are at a webinar tonight. You could go um, watch some of the speakers in our guest speaker series. There's a whole webinar on data science and algebra, back to school from the fall, focused at the secondary and the elementary level, and then webinars more on topic specific. You know how to sign up for our webinars because you signed up for this one, but just to give it a plug, uh, these are the upcoming webinars. We're having one in a few weeks on puzzles, games, and art. Our guest speaker is continuing with Dan Finkel, Katronia Ag, Desiree, Desiree Harrison, and Jennifer Saw throughout the spring. And we have webinars on data science, geometry, numbers, and teachers are going to share how they use Polypad. So that's upcoming and exciting uh, to think about seeing some of you at those events. So we are almost up on the hour. I uh, that is the end of my prepared sharing. Again, I hope there was some ideas here that were helpful to you. If you have any questions in the, that you'd like answered about logic and computing or anything else whatsoever, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. The one thing that actually I wanted to say on the teacher page is under tutorials here, uh, you can find videos about all the teacher tools, how to add students, how to make classes, how to share them with each other, um, how to share polypads with students so you can do that there as well. Uh, Shirley, I plan to use this tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah, I've had fun doing this over the past week in school, and I think my students have enjoyed it as well. So um, I'm glad that you have a plan for tomorrow. It is the the school the type of school year where we are uh, going one day at a time, right? So um, we'll take any, any plans we can get. Awesome. Any other questions, anyone? Feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Appreciate you coming. Um, again, uh, if you have if, if you have suggestions about how we can improve these tools, feel free to share those with us. We are Mathagon Org on Twitter. I'm putting that in there. I'm at David Porus. Uh, I know I connect with a lot of you on Twitter. It's a great supportive math educator community. So if you're not giving us a follow, uh, please do so. And it's a great way to share all of what's um, going on. Mark just commented in the chat. Mark shares all sorts of great stuff on um, on Polypad. He had a couple this morning on math and art. Go check them out. Um, so give us a follow, and more importantly, share what you are doing. Right? Put put screenshots and links of the ways that you've been using these with students. We we learn and grow better as a community than just the ideas that I've shared in this webinar. This is just the beginning. So um, please share and. Uh, Look forward to seeing what you come up with. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll hang on for another minute or so. Otherwise, I will end the broadcast. If you have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. And I, um, if not, look forward to seeing you at future events down the road. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great night or morning or day, wherever you are. And. Uh, We'll connect again down the road, hopefully. Take care. Good night, everybody.